Welcome, welcome, guys. We are back for another episode of The Lock In. I am joined, as usual, by now the only man in Ireland with a double century to his name. As a cricketer, I could only have ever dreamt of getting a double ton. Maybe one day I will follow in this man's footsteps and get a poker double ton. He is, of course, Darrow Kearney. Darrow, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, David. No, I'm, I have no doubt that you'll follow me. You are actually second on that list. So, uh, and at the rate you cash, I think you'll probably get there within a year or two. Um, but it is nice. I was the first to get to 100. Um, I just barely pit Mick McCloskey, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, it's nice to kick on since then. For sure. Well, you would have played quite a, a few games less than him in the uh, you know pre 2000s. Um, anyway. Since the last time we were on the air, Darren and I made a quick trip to UKIPT London. I think we talked about being packing our bags and getting ready for that one. Um, it must be said it was a stop that continued the recent trend of PokerStars events where the players received really good treatment, really good experiences overall. Darren, we both wrote about how much we enjoyed the event. In my piece, I covered Martin Jacobson's win in the UK IPT Maine. Shout out to former guest Martin, of course. It was another impressive performance by him, grinding from a short stack to win it all. Not dissimilar, actually, to his WSOP main event campaign when he took that one down. Can you talk a little about the mentality of grinding that short stack, sort of not panicking, laddering, surviving. You are famous for your poker cockroachedness. Yeah, I mean, it's all about basically just not losing your head and not getting impatient as well. Um, you know that every time you put your chips in the middle, it could very well be your last hand. And that can pull you in one or two ways. Sometimes people just want the tension to be over and they they move too rashly. Or sometimes people are a little bit too precious about their tournament life and they pass spots. I was actually sitting uh, to the immediate right of Martin for most of the second last day. And we were both short stacked. And he was very, very patient. He basically picked his spots well. Crucially, he did get lucky uh, a few times. He shoved over a, over a button raise at one point with Ace Queen and he was up against Kings and got there. Um, and there were another few suckouts as well. And that that was essentially the difference, in, or at least in my mind, that was the difference between him uh, kicking on to have a decent stack for the last day and me uh, busting late on, on on that day. But either way, you do just kind of have to be very disciplined. Now, Martin is super disciplined. Um, doesn't talk very much at the table, even though he's very friendly, um, just very focused individual. Um, and it doesn't matter whether he has 200 big blinds or five big blinds he's going to give it his full focus and play it as properly uh, play as optimally as as possible he sure does well in your piece dara you focused on many of the positives uh, deriving from this event poker stars certainly seem to have turned a corner fully now offering real value and quality of experience to players who, who make these live trips to their now regional tours and obviously these ept stops too why is it massively important and why should ambassadors of other sites like us give credit where it's due here? Um, well, I think, I mean, poker is, a, is an industry, industry as a whole. And, you know, when players have a bad experience at an event, <clears throat> that's going to not just affect their likelihood to play um, more events by that operator or play on the site of the sponsor. It's going to affect just they may, they might give up on poker completely. Conversely, if they have a very good experience, that encourages them to keep going and play and play other events and uh, essentially it's a sort of a, a rising tide lifts all boats or a or a rising tide sinks all boats if it's if if if, <laughs> if 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 it's a tide of criticism or negative experience so it's very important to realize that poker is is while while there are individual operators who are competing with each other um, for different slices of the pie it's in everybody's interest if the pie gets bigger and if the pie gets smaller it doesn't matter you, you if, if you win all the pie but it's 10 percent of what it used to be that's not a victory either um but i think the most important thing really is just to focus on sort of you want poker to be fun i mean that is the whole point of poker it's a recreation uh, some of us are lucky enough to be able to make a living from it but for the vast majority of players who play it it's something they do for fun and if they're not having fun then we as an industry are failing them and that needs to be called out and um not 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 just because our bottom lines will suffer but because we're basically just not providing what we're supposed to provide yeah 
great points. Uh, well, speaking of quality experiences and, and tides rising, right after the UK IPT London, we travelled to, in your case, travelled back to Dublin for the highly anticipated Unibet International Poker Open, or IPO as it's commonly known. This was a six-day event over the Halloween weekend, and it's fair to say Nick O'Hara knocked it out of the park. I personally have never seen the Bonington Hotel looking so good. The room was dressed and lit beautifully. The live stream feature table always makes it feel a little bit special at that event too. Shout out to Tom Parsons, uh, future guest on the chip race, by the way. Watch out for that show. Who played a blinder in the commentary booth all weekend. He flew solo for a lot of that because actually, as it turned out, Darren and I, who would normally join the commentators at these IPOs, were pretty busy playing all the tournaments from morning, noon and night. Um, Tom has a real future, in my opinion, in broadcasting, and uh, I would encourage everyone to check out that uh, commentary stint he did if you do like looking back over feature tables or final tables. And I would also encourage you to check out his Twitch stream. It felt like every table, Dara, at the event was full. 100 qualifiers sent by Unibet, 809 people in the main event. There were loads of side events, including, of course, the Chip Race Mystery Bounty. Dara, you went deep in everything you played from what I could see. How did you enjoy the festival? Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. Basically, I could just echo your comments there. Uh, the Bonington has never looked so good. Um, and it, for me, there was a quite a stark contrast. Like The last two events I played in the Bonington were, uh, were Stars events, Road to PSPC and, um, and UK IPT. And both of those felt a lot grungier and sort of low rent. And some of that had to do with uh, the room not being dressed up as, as nicely. I think a lot of it had to do with there being no live stream. Um, when there's no live stream, an event always does feel that sort of that much smaller. Um, whereas people love getting on a live stream and, uh, uh, you know, get, get getting their face on the Internet. So but also it just ran so smoothly. Um, the the TDs were, were were top of the game. They had the best dealers. Um, everything about it just felt very easy. And, you know, you notice these things when they go wrong. Um, and then you realize that it's not actually as effortless as it looks when it goes right. Um, but uh, Nick, in particular, always seems to get it right at these events. Uh, he's probably the best, I would say, tournament organizer in the world right now. Um, in terms of just he understands every aspect of it from how to lay out a schedule to how to do all the logistics around getting people registered, um, et cetera, to actually running the event smoothly since he's a world-class tournament director himself. Yeah, he is a, a master of so many aspects of poker. And uh, yeah, as you say there, he, he manages to bring all his skill sets uh, at different points. Um, in the main event, there was obviously the big one there. Uh, there was a three-way deal in the end. Francis Ilan Kukrovitz took home the lion's share of the 200k prize pool. He pocketed 30,900 and claimed the much-coveted IPO trophy with Dutchman Alexander de Decker and Greek player Alexandros Fime winning 25 and a bit K and 23 and a half K respectively. Uh, as Dara said, I was uh, sort of in the mix as well. Uh, we were sort of just going from tournament to tournament, really. It was one of those festivals where you, you started on the Wednesday, it was sort of a slow build up with a little tourney and then, you know, straight into the high roller, or I think it was called a super high roller, even though it, it has to be one of those asterisks or um, inverted commas ones. Um, but uh, I was very fortunate actually to make a deep run in the main, ultimately busting in fourth place. In the final hand, I lost a flip with Ace King suited uh, versus tens, which is obviously fair. And uh, could it have gone the other way? Yes. And I think it would have had a decent shot at winning but that's the way it goes and I can't really complain with six left I did a pretty massive suck out on Noel McMahon with my king queen spiking a king against his ace queen on the river there were a couple of hands though that are maybe worth talking about from my deep run and I thought maybe that was the way to do the second half of this episode I covered these in my latest VSO piece they've been getting a bit of traction online as well on Twitter and whatnot I, I posted them out there we obviously promised you an episode from the event which we couldn't deliver on in the end because we were just so busy but that's coming now um reflectively if you like dara both hands were jacks and i know you were in the commentary box for one not for the other but i know you have strong views on both of these hands i'm going to 
sort of uh, quickly do the first one here. Um, with roughly 25 players left, a very solid Scottish player, Jamie Bachu, I think his name is, opened under the gun two off a stack of about 42 big blinds. British player Stephen Frew, who I had profiled as a tight player, flattered the hijack with what was said to be Queen 3, although I've seen how online or on Twitter now he's claiming he had King Queen. So maybe there was a, a dodgy RFI card, RFID card in the mix there let's give it let's give him credit there for the king queen maybe that makes a bit more sense mm -hmm. um and then the talented uh cummins irish player uh jonathan cummins squeeze from the small blind and uh playing 45 big blinds i woke up in the big blind with jacks so actually do you know what there's a clip of these hands i'm going to insert these clips now dara so Yep. Roll it there, Roisin, as uh, Gay Byrne used to say, and we will come back and talk about it in a second. I thought it was roll it there, Colette. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was Colette. I think it was a Roisin as well. I'm sure he went through many of these video artists at the years. <laughs> Bachu, very standard open here with the King Jack suited. Cummins should fold the S9 here in the small blind. Lap and pocket Jacks in the big blind. Don't know if he's checked his hand yet. Don't know if he sees the magic that is beneath those fingertips. Cummins. Wait. Fru has called the hijack with queen three offsuit. And we see a squeeze from Cummins over Bachu's open. I have no idea what Fru is doing on this feature table, but he is getting very, very, very out of line. It opened up the squeeze in the small blind from Cummins. And Lappin has a decision. 45 big blinds. Pocket jacks. Deep in the main event. 5% of the field remaining. Maybe even fewer at this stage of the day. And a very reasonable four bet jam from the pocket jacks. He knows Bachu doesn't get really out of line in early position. He could fold. There is a world in which Lappin just lets this go. But I would be very surprised. And he does actually fold. Wow, I do think there is a world in which folding is not unreasonable. Depending on the ranges you're giving these players. But that is a tight, tight fold. From David Lappin in the big blind. And he's going to hate that this goes fold, fold so quickly. He's going to wish that he shoved. Okay, Dara, so after a long tank, as we saw there, longer than that video would suggest, actually, I did a bit of clipping. Uh, I did find the fold. I was obviously disappointed to see that the opener had a suited King Jack. The flatter had that bizarre Queen three off suit or maybe King Queen. And the three better was actually light in this instance with the Ace nine off suit. Had I shoved, I would have added over a third to my stack uncontested. What's your analysis? Yeah, I mean, when I first heard about this hand, it definitely seemed too tight to me. Um, uh, this is a point of the tournament. This, I think this is something a lot of people misunderstand. They think because we're getting near the final table that ICM is starting to ratchet up. But actually, ICM is coming down and has been coming down ever since the money bubble. And it's 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 coming down towards a sort of a, a new low somewhere on the second last table. So ICM is a factor, but it's not actually massive. Um, and it does mean that if we shove, they also have to fold a little bit tighter. So given all that, I thought that this uh, was a shove. Now, I, I I hate these spots because it always seems to be the case that when you shove, you just have that bad feeling in your gut and then they snap call and they've got kings or aces or something and you, and you feel very regretful. But the fact of the matter is, you know, players are sometimes added as, 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 as was the case in this case. Like the ace man squeeze is far too wide. Uh, so I did run this and... Uh, even if he's not too wide, we are supposed to go with jacks. It's not massively profitable, but it does make a healthy amount. 
uh, enough that we probably have to just take this spot because it's quite important not just to sort of get to the final table but to get there with a decent stack so we can challenge for the top spots where most of the money is um and uh but the the second thing is if we widen the range is to include his range the, his actual hand and i didn't give it to him 100 percent of the time because like who knows maybe he only does this a quarter of the time maybe he picked up some read that the initial opener didn't look very strong and the and the flatter and, and never flats a hand that he's going to call off um so so i gave him 25 percent frequency with this and some other similar type of hands and now jacks becomes massively profitable um far too profitable to 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 consider folding um, it, it is a gross spot, and the only defense you can ever make in these spots is that you are risking your entire stack, um, and maybe you'll be able to pick up chips without doing that. Um, but yeah, purely from a theoretical point of view, I would say this is you, you have to go with this hand. I, I did actually walk over with Dara Davy to get you. This was shortly before dinner, and you were talking to the guy beside you, trying to find out what what hand he had. Um, so it was obviously very heavily on your mind. Um, as I pointed out to you, like just wait ten minutes and it'll be on the live stream. But uh, you wanted to, you you were so you were so uh, discombobulated <laughs> by this hand that you wanted to know the information straight away. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, my first instinct when I looked down was that it was a shove, and absolutely, I felt like in a sort of uh, pure environment, it, it would certainly be a shove. Um, but then, over those several minutes deep in thought, I ultimately did change my mind. The spot seemed fraught with danger echoing a little bit of what you said there a moment ago but in a tournament where you can chip up very easily no disrespect to the overall standard but there's a lot of recreationals in the field I would certainly rate myself to be able to just chip away at those guys every orbit open maybe a pip or two wider you know just have good navigational sense of how to you know proceed through flops a bit better than them maybe be able to pick up live reads off them in position in certain situations and I felt like this was a hand where I was going to negate all of those skills and basically just put myself in a guessing game where yes uh, the, the vast majority of the time or the high likelihood was I would just get this one through or even if you know worst case scenario or well it's not the worst case scenario but even another case scenario was ace king and I get called well I can obviously win that flip and then I have a really big stack and maybe I can you know build up a, a kind of a chip lead type scenario on the run in to the final table and that was the other component in my mind I was thinking well like maybe this is exactly the time in the tournament where I should take a risk like this mm. and uh, go for the larger stack and yeah. then be able to kind of use it um, but I suppose in the end I, I just felt like pushing those small edges over lots and lots of hands it was really compelling I had chipped up throughout that day pretty easily and uh, you know while the reward was clearly there a huge pickup if I get it through um, I ultimately thought the edge was slim enough versus the ranges. Again, I actually got these guys' ranges all wrong. I thought, well, King Jacks was a pretty reasonable open from the first guy, but I really didn't uh, put the squeezer on something as light as Ace Nine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that well, that is the difficulty. But but you also uh, touched on a point there, which is super important too. I, I think our natural instincts in these spots is we we don't want to bust the tournament now, but we also have to think of sort of the opportunity cost of missing missing a spot where we get to be massive chip leader uh on the second final table which is an amazing spot because everybody else is kind of forced into the coffin then and has to play really really snug and the, the number of times the chip leader wins the tournament from there is, is is much higher than it should be based on the percentage of chips they have because of that so i think and and you know i i, I played a bit with mark buckley this uh the, at this festival and that and, and that's very much a feature of mark's game he's very happy to gamble two three tables out in these spots to get that big stack and then pound on um and that is another aspect of icn that people often don't consider um i think our natural cognitive biases <clears throat> push us towards thinking of god if i shove this jackson he's got queens kings or aces it's going to be absolutely terrible i'm going to be out of the tournament but that's kind of sort of like worst case scenario thinking we, we place a, a, a far higher emphasis on that than we do the the number of times for example they just they just fold and we um we add a third to our stack or the amount of times they have ace king and we win the flip and now we have a big stack so uh, you you kind of have to fight against your natural instinct sometimes in those spots like you mentioned chipping up and yeah that's a good argument but it's probably a better argument in the wsap main event or an ept which is a much slower structure if you did find yourself in a similar field this structure was quite i mean it wasn't super fast but it was fast enough near the end so it's not like you're going to be able to Sm uh, small ball your way to a chip lead for example uh, you are going to have to go for it at some point 
Great points uh, and, and something I will certainly uh, take on board going forward. To the second hand, with nine players left, I was in a bit of an ICM cough and I was four of nine. My 35 big blinds were certainly a very workable stack, but it would, of course, be a disaster at this point to bust before the short stacks, two of which I think had around 10 bigs. Um, from the low jack in this one, the chip leader and ultimate winner, Kukrovitz, opened he's obviously going to open fairly light there although I would say he wasn't the type of chip leader to take the piss he was sort of always in there with pretty reasonable ranges uh, the action folded to Fime in the small blind and I think he was three of nine at the time uh, and he just shoves 45 big blinds a huge shove uh, once again into big blind uh, four of nine just slightly shorter than Fime I look down at pocket jacks again here's that clip 45 big blinds effective here for Fime with the Ace-King offsuit. But Lappin has jacks in the big blind. Fime, I think he can go both ways here. I think he can use a non-all-in sizing. But with the short stack, using the all-in three bet here is not going to be unreasonable for 45 big blinds on a final table versus the chip leader. And it will put David Lappin oh my goodness, in a very interesting situation. Jacks. Oh my and God. Fime does move all in. I think this is the correct move. And oh, what a spot this is now for David. Lappin, he's, in, he's folded Jacks in a spot like this it. before. Yeah, he was quite tilted by the Jacks hands. Yet. Well, he wasn't tilted, but he was uh, disappointed, disappointed when he found out what his opponent actually had. <laughs> yeah. And now he's got another Jack spot. This is so gross. I don't even know what the answer is here. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a fold. It's super close. It it's would definitely close. be borderline. Queens, queens were definitely going with tens. I think we're definitely folding. Definitely folding. So Jax is really difficult. And Lappin, he has been edge passing a lot of these spots. We yeah, saw him making some tighter folds in the big blind earlier you. today. We saw him not opening hands that would be towards the bottom of his offsuit range. And yeah. that's a great yeah. fold. I'm, I really do I'm not surprised to see him fold there. Uh, D David's tendency is very much as if it's anyway close, he'll he'll err on the side of caution and fold. And I think um, that is a very reasonable fold from the pocket jacks. Of course, yeah. Yeah, it was I, in good shape. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we ran that, and and that's actually correct. Yeah. And even if it's incorrect, it's not incorrect by much. Yeah. And can be justified on the basis that it's his, it's his entire stack for a small edge. Yeah. And you're just hoping the guy doesn't have it. Yeah. And if you get that double up, you're not even second in chips. I don't think chip leader has. Over seven million. Second in chips is at least four and a half million. Yeah. So that full double, it's not like it puts you in a position where you can then go on to command this final table. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a great fold, and he actually didn't think too much about, too long about it either. Um, I think once once you rule out the guy isn't doing that with hands like eights, nines. Yeah. Um, and then you just think, okay, maybe he has tens, but then the I don't even want to get it in against Ace King given yeah. the ICM. Yeah. Um, and he can have queens. Just, Nothing to say he doesn't have queens as well. And I think so. Lappin will be very happy to see that it was his king offsuit that was used in the small blind as well. Once he makes that fall with jacks. Yeah. Okay, so Dara, honestly, this one sort of felt like an easy enough decision. In this spot, I put Kukrovitz on a fairly wide range, as I should. Probably around 25% of hands, something in that region. But I put Fimi on an extremely narrow range, um, given how the ICM handcuffs were also on him. The specific hands that made the most sense for the shove were the ace king and ace king suited. So I figured him for those hands a huge proportion of the time. It's actually how I would have played ace king or ace king suited in that spot. So I kind of get it. Um, I also thought he might play queens and kings like this too. Um, aces wasn't out of the question, but that would be a severe overplay. So I did discount that considerably. One combination of jacks and six combos of tens still out there. Both should flat, and I think this guy was knowledgeable enough to flat, but I also didn't want to fully rule them out, so I just discounted them as well. And then pretty much plugged that range into my internal computer, um, including the weightings that I assigned. It didn't feel super close, so as you can see on uh, the, the clip there, uh, I relinquished fairly quickly with a wry smile. Notice there's no cuts in that video, so I did only take about 45, 50 seconds to make that decision. Dara, while this... One, I didn't think was too close. Queens would certainly be a gross one. I do think a lot of players would have gone with it, not paying enough attention to the ICM. In fact, when I posted this to social media, it would bear out that a lot of people said, oh no, you just got to go with Jax there. Even if he's got Ace King, you got 53%, you're blocking the straights and come on, you're in an amazing spot to, you know, uh, double up. But that's when it goes well, when it goes badly and he binks his ace or his king, uh, then I'm out the door in ninth for about three grand, which is a pretty big disaster. Your thoughts? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think people just don't internalize ICM very well in this spot. They think just because you're ahead, that's enough. Um, and, you know, even if you knew that he had Ace King, I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty sure this isn't a call, um, even as a 53, 54% favorite, uh, because you need to be a bigger favorite because of ICM. You probably need to be pushing up towards 60%. Um, and the, this, I mean, this, this was impressive to me on, on on a number of fronts. I mean, first of all, I agree with you. I mean, I didn't even bother running this spot because I'm pretty sure I'm absolutely certain this is a fold because of ICM. Um, Queens, Queens might be close. Um, yeah, I think Queens will be a close one. I think Queens is close, but but I think Jax is a fairly clear fold. But he, but you know, I was doing commentary at the time, and when I saw that you were Jax, I didn't immediately go, oh, "This is a fold." I had to think about it as well. Um, you you worked it out very quickly, which was the first impressive thing. But I think this the, probably the most impressive thing was often when players have made a inverted commas incorrect fold um, not so long ago, and they, <laughs> which they now know is incorrect. They're l- much less inclined to fold again, uh, particularly in a spot so similar, like literally the same hand um, when it comes up again. And the number of times I've reviewed live tournaments with students and they've said, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess when I thought about it afterwards, I realized it was a, it was a call, but I had just folded this other hand um, and therefore I, I just wasn't in the mood for folding. I think it, it requires a lot of mental strength and mental resilience to sort of shrug off the disappointment. And, and, and I mean, I was with you when you found out that that the previous wall was bad and you certainly weren't happy about it. Um, so to be able to quickly reset and just take take this as a new spot and 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 come to the correct decision very quickly, I thought that was impressive. I mean, any, any, overall, I was really impressed with your your mental game this um this festival because just before you went you fired your last your last one bullet with the, the one you propelled all the way to fourth place in the main event you had actually took taken a horror show beat uh on the bubble of the super high roller as we called it um <laughs> against eventual winner simon wilson so that must have been very difficult to shrug off as well but you 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 managed to successfully shrug, shrug it off jump straight into the into the ipo main on your last bullet and and bag bottle of wine in hand there <laughs> bottle of wine in hand yeah you didn't look like you were you were at your most professional but uh, you know, as myself, Dara, have often noted, like you often look like you're tilted, but it doesn't seem to really affect your play, um, which is which is very much the main thing. Um, we we were also talking before the main event final table. Uh, we definitely didn't want you to bust before fifth. We reckon fifth was sort of the minimum that <laughs> you wouldn't absolutely be completely devastated. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you you I think you had an eleventh or something similar to that in the previous IPO, and that and that does feel having. Having a lot of tenths and elevens on my own career, I know they feel particularly bad. Um, you're that near to the final table, but you you get you just get a few buy-ins. So yeah, well, I mean, overall, this was undoubtedly the correct fold, but it was still impressive that you were able to find it and find it so quickly. No, I appreciate the kind words about my mental game. It, it was a particularly uh, tough one, actually. I won't lie, and that super high roller in inverted commas, I had pocket tens. I was probably about like three of. 11 left or whatever it was and the guy who was two of 11 left uh basically had the same stack as me um he uh i open pocket tens from the cutoff and he just shoves 24 bigs in on the button and when it got back to me i I, like i took a few seconds but i was just like oh wow this is just going to be small pairs a lot like i'm sure he can do this with ace queen ace jack suited maybe but maybe king queen suited that kind of hand but like actually most of the range that will go for this sort of like unexploitable big shove is going to be like fours through eights or nines and uh, maybe nines even in juice, maybe just fours through eights. And um, obviously I'm in amazing shape against those hands. I feel like any better hand than my hand would induce. So I felt like it was a worst case scenario flip and there was a lot of very good case scenarios. So I call and he has pocket sixes and flops a six and turns a six and I'm gone. And I was bothered. I'm not going to lie. I normally kind of shrug off my beats live pretty well. I know you know me as a, um, a, a, a profuse swearer online about things, but actually I, I tend to be reasonably okay 
live but that one was just a, it was kind of I was just a bit sad and I went back to my room and I rang Sharon and I was just having the chats and she was away for the for the night and I was sort of like oh I don't know if I'll even bother playing this turbo leg I might just jump in the hyper turbo in the morning because I'm just not feeling it you know that kind of way I just not feeling like jumping back on the horse but then I got this great idea of just like get a bottle of wine from the centre next door shamelessly bring it in despite the fact that I'm sure you're meant to have your own booze in the body <laughs> So it's probably very unambassadorial, but I wanted a nice bottle of wine. I wanted to treat myself to something that I would really enjoy rather than some crappy Gordon's gin and tonic. So I brought in the bottle of wine. And I, what I would say is you're right. I, I like I don't tilt in my play, I don't think, but I was sort of seething. And um, I was fortunate enough to sort of, you know, bag up a stack that day. I think I bagged up a, 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 just over 100K, maybe 120K or something like that. And uh, I was getting really tilted by the English lads at my table. There was one particularly annoying guy from, I think it was Liverpool at the festival, who was reminding me of Kasuf with the sort of inane chatter. And I, I think at different breaks, I came up to you and I came up to Nick Newport and Darren saying that this guy was doing my head in. I think I'm going to start a fight with him. But again, you know, trying to be a solid ambassador. I, I at least didn't pick that fight this week. Although you do remember a fight that I had in London only a few days later. So I am capable, Dara. Yeah, I def- yeah, I, I, put, I put that in my London report uh, because actually a few people asked me about it at, at the details of the fight. Also, I think w- we might be impugning Liverpool. I'm pretty sure that gentleman was not from Liverpool, even though there was a lot of Liverpool people. Apologies, like, Liverpool. <laughs> he, had a, he, he, he had an accent almost identical to Kasuf's and Kasuf is not from uh, Liverpool. Um uh, so yeah, this this guy was from somewhere further south than Liverpool. I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, it's funny how those things uh, can uh, spark you off more when you're just not in a in a good mood. Um, it's interesting to me too, just how blurry your memory is. You actually bagged up 150k. Uh, you want you want to flip right at the end if you remember. Well, I, I, most of the wine was gone by the end. And also, <laughs> you completely neglected the fact that we went we we went down to uh, to have dinner um, opposite the Skyline Hotel. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of your bust out, um, you put me back on a steady keel, Dara. You, you got you yeah, got into my, my head. Niece, you were like back on the horse. Was, my niece was salad. Uh, just <laughs> yeah, because I do actually remember uh, putting it on Instagram because I um, bust as well earlier. Obviously, that we were having uh, salads are for losers. <laughs> we're both on the salad grind right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your you, your weight loss has been extremely impressive. Um, uh, it, it's 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 definitely good to see because you are at that age now where it can kind of go one of two ways. <laughs> you either just let yourself go and you gradually become more and more unhealthy, and uh, we're all at your funeral in about fifteen years, or uh, or you know you uh, you snap out of it and you become a healthier older person. Yeah, it's just it's really sad being hungry all the time. <laughs> I mean, you were so hungry. It was I'm so hungry. I, all you, were, you were literally just talking about food all the time and thinking about food. I, I, I wasn't greatly helping them when I once I figured it <laughs> out and we were side by side at the high roller table. I started sending you um, pictures of chicken wings. On, on. <laughs> he did do this. He did. do, Ladies and gents, Daryl Carney, a good friend in certain situations when he knows I'm downbeat. I'm just taking my my lumps with the pocket sixes, takes me off for a salad, has a good chat with me. But then also. He's a bollocks too, you know. I'm sitting beside him. He knows I'm really hungry, and he just sends me pictures of elephant and castle chicken wings. <laughs> Had to be done. <laughs> Had to be done. Well, look, thank you so much for that analysis. I hope you guys out there enjoyed. Uh, I know that's not normally what we do on this show, but it, it seemed pertinent. And and to be honest, we were just short of material. We didn't know what to talk about. We're not even aware of what's happening outside of the Bonington for the last week. There's, I'm sure there's news in poker, but we're not aware of it. Um, but uh, before we go. You may have seen from social media uh, or from logging on to the Unibet client, in fact, that we have a completely new revamped nightly schedule, putting bigger guarantees uh, on all these tournaments, adding weekly leaderboards so there's even more extra value to pick up, slashing the rake so that we're now the lowest rake on every tournament type in the industry. Um, you may have noticed this. You may also have noticed uh, some bath pictures of mine, uh, which I will continue to plaster all over Twitter until such time as we start meeting these guarantees. Right, Dara? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is a terrible time for Elon Musk to have taken over so that you can literally post any, any old shite that you want on Twitter. <laughs> Um, I feel sorry for the poker community at large. Um, 
but yeah, it is what it is. The new schedule is is, is very good. Now I haven't played since the IPO um, because I've been catching up with other stuff, finishing the book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, uh, I am looking forward next week to getting back full full time into the in, in, into playing the nightly schedule. Well, I slobber knockered, Dara. I've slobber knockered. You have slobber knockered. I have. have, you, I, have I, you ever had? Have you had your first slobber knocker yet? I have not had the pleasure of the of my first slobber knock yet. Um, <laughs> but I'm very much looking forward to it. Just in case anyone's wondering what that is, and uh, uh, please, uh, 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 sort of a, a warning, a trigger warning, do not Google that word, or, or certainly do not Urban Dictionary that phrase. Uh, that is the uh, idea of Andy Payton, uh, probably the best tournament name. The Fofty, that's a really good name as well. We've got some great tournament names right now. Uh, Andy's put this great schedule together, and we really appreciate him delivering on this uh, just when he took over our tournament schedule. He's doing a great job. Finally, one last shout out for our great pal, Alex Henry, who celebrated his ton. Okay, you might be the double ton man, Dara, but he celebrated his century. Uh, that's 100 DSO festivals. What a phenomenal achievement that is. Uh, they had their recent one, their 100th one in Honesty. Uh, it attracted over a thousand entries. And from the pictures and videos I saw, it looks like an amazing time was had by all. Dara, that's it for another episode of The Lock-In. It remains for me to thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we will have we will rustle up a guest for the next one. Don't worry, folks. But uh, for this one, we decided uh, just to talk Matt about the IPO mostly. Matt Savage is coming. <laughs> Matt Savage. We've got Matt Savage. I think I booked him today. Excellent. Proper proper A lister, guys. Check that one out. Until next time, take care, everyone. <laughs>